what also struck me about your book was how it doesn't just replicate some, you know, violence and fear and, and, and or police training and, and racism, but how people who were outside of a very specific, traditionally white masculine mode of of uh, policing or who they were were kind of um, shunned out of the way and weren't necessarily welcomed into the fold. Can you speak a bit about, there was one, uh, I think it was Adam, who he's referred to in the book, uh, one, one person who was mocked for not necessarily being as strong as some of the other people in the academy, and, and how did that kind of shake out? Yeah, yeah, so I write about that in the last chapter of the book, just kind of who who makes it to graduation? You know, what kinds of cadets what kinds of these new officers are considered a good fit for this institution and, and why. Um, so Adam is an example that I use um, to really illustrate this point because, you know, in many ways, Adam would be considered sort of a traditionally um, ideal conception of what a police officer is. He's kind of tall, he's like six feet tall, he's white, he's a man, um, he's from the South. And he was really, really excited to be a police officer. He really wanted to be a police officer. Um, but he was not particularly strong. Um, he didn't do particularly well in defensive tactics or in the physical fitness training. And he also you know, got a lot of flack from his trainers for using sort of an expansive vocabulary. Um, one of his you know, uh, trainers complained to me that um, you know, he was not an author, that he should be writing the way that the newspaper reads. Um, so there were a lot of complaints about this. Trainers just really relentlessly mocked him and um, a few other cadets that were, you know, really targeted throughout the academy, um, both to his face and, you know, behind his back. Um, the other cadets knew about it. They talked to me about it. Um, it came up in interviews with other, you know, cadets that there were um, definitely, you know, uh, cadets in the class that the trainers would kind of pit against each other. Um, so yeah, he really didn't, in, in some ways he fit the mold, in other ways he really didn't. Um, and in particular, just his sort of inability to fight, to physically fight in the way that the um, academy trainers wanted him to, really put a target on his back. Um, he made it pretty far, he made it almost to the end. Um, and throughout the academy as I watched, I continually heard trainers talk about, we want to fire him, we need to fire him. We're essentially just creating enough of a paper trail um, to be able to do this. And typically what would happen is, um, you know, the command staff would bring a cadet into the office. Of course, I didn't, I was not able to watch this part. Um, but what was told to me afterwards was that the cadets were usually given the option to resign um, or be fired. And the reason for them usually choosing to resign is that then they could at least continue to apply to other departments in the state. Um, so while on paper, Adam was not technically fired or terminated, he essentially was um, forced to resign. And this was reflected as well in uh, people who were applying to policing if they were women or people of color or women of color. W is that your assessment? I mean, my assessment there is that um, cadets who are not white, ma straight, white, masculine men um, certainly have a different experience in the academy and they have a more complicated and tougher time fitting into the overall narrative of the institution, which, you know, really is one and one where um, masculine, straight, white men are protecting vulnerable people from bad guys. Mm. Each of these roles is deeply gendered and racialized, right? The, the, the patri I'm sorry to butt in, but that patriarchal notion, I think, is really under discussed. And it's great that you highlight it because it also feeds into some of the racist tropes that also are prevalent. And, and like the coded language, speaking about parts of the city where black and Latino people lived and the perception that these white kind of heteronormative cops have about being the great protectors. Mm -hmm. It's it's a it's you can see who they might think they're protecting people from. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, one striking example I, I think about a lot just in terms of it being quite um, symbolic, I suppose, is one of the sergeants at an academy that I, I went to had this small sort of like tchotchke um, statue, maybe, you know, six inches tall in his office um, of an officer like holding a woman <laughs> while the officer had like wings on yeah um, 
So really these like hero complexes are, are quite prominent. And that what that means for people who are not, you know, again, straight, masculine, white men, is that they have trouble fitting somewhere into this narrative as the hero, as the protector. If they're supposed to either be the bad guy or um, the vulnerable and the innocent and the weak, mm. then they have a lot of trouble kind of figuring out where they stand uh, within the organization. However, that does not mean um, that women don't make it in, that they don't succeed, that they don't graduate. And same with people of color, um, they do. And part of my argument in this book actually is really challenging demographic diversity reform efforts as they are, as they are currently conceptualized as sort of um, a fix all for policing in that this process of selection and socialization means that whoever makes it in and then makes it through to graduation aligns themselves, you know, very heavily, very strongly with the existing institution. And, and and that institution replicates many of the things that we've talked about, but also this, uh, you talk about the, the socialization of state violence through something like an us, uh, one, one of the planks being an us versus them mentality. How did that show itself in your research? Yeah, so I write about that in, in one of the chapters and um, I originally had titled it us versus thems because there are a lot of groups um, that kind of represent um, I separate them out into institutional threats or physical threats, um, real or imagined to, you know, the, the policing organization or to police officers themselves. Um, so, for example, um, you would probably be one of these threats as um, a source of media, um, particularly a, leftist, a dirty hippie. <laughs> Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, you know, you would present an institutional threat to the police. They're quite nice. wary of media in general. Not all, though. Fox News was often on in the break rooms in the back um, in you know, the, the recruiting officers offices. Um, so certainly not all media, but th that was one. Um, activist groups, particularly leftist activist groups. Um, so it wasn't they weren't just taking aim, for example, um, I guess literally, literally or figuratively at um, Black Lives Matter, but they also had issues with, you know, Occupy movements, for example. Mm. Um, show, you know, video footage of that, of officers, um, you know, spraying a crowd from an Occupy um, protest or demonstration with, you know, OC spray or some version of that. Um, and one training officer referenced this as watering the hippies. Um, during a, a class. So those were, you know, two certainly groups that presented an institutional threat um, to officers. And the trainers would often tell cadets to make sure that if someone, if there was an activist trying to kind of um, push them into a reaction on camera, to not give in to that, um, and that they were simply trying to, um, you know, pu again, push officers into a, a reaction to then further their own cause. Um, they also had, um, again, we talked a little bit about this, but a sense that there were evil people out there wanting to and engaging in ambushes of the police. Um, this does happen sometimes, however, not very often. It's it's really rare for an actual ambush of police officers, a fatal ambush to happen. Um, when they do happen, however, they are very, very meaningful for officers. Um, this occurred when I was at these academies, um, I, th I think it was in New Jersey at the time, um, which was not the state that I was in, um, was quite far from the state that I was in. And that that instance had a huge effect on um, sort of the mental state of the officers that I was around in terms of intensifying their um, you know, fears and their suspicion of others. Um, so there were a lot of these groups and part of this process of being socialized into state violence for these cadets was learning who are these out groups? Who are these threats? How do I identify them? Um, and then as a result, their world becomes quite small. Um, the people who they can trust, who are considered in group, who are considered safe, um, becomes really just first responders, to be honest. Um, and that becomes their new you know, social world and position in the broader world. It's just very, very distinct from what the stated purpose of police is, which is protect and serve versus we are warriors beating back the hordes of leftists and, and black people or Latino people, essentially. Like, I mean, that seems very different from the mindset that is portrayed that reinforces the bad apples myth. Like to, mm -hmm. to make it through this police academy, 
you kind of have to buy in as you write. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I, I totally think that's true. I think you, in order to make it a graduation, you absolutely have to, I mean, you have to demonstrate to the officers. There's these, you know, formal requirements, of course, you have to pass the tests, you have to show up, <laughs> right. um, you have to follow sort of a litany of rules. Um, but you also do have to show that you're an, a cultural fit for the institution, that you can move through the world looking at like, sounding like, acting like a police officer. And really what I argue in the book is that a lot of that hinges on violence, um, engaging in it, being willing, arguably I say eager um, to engage violence, particularly when it's brought to you. Um, so yeah, I, I would definitely agree.